Okay. Um, I think we can start. People are uh, uh, coming in as they come in. I just want to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, first uh, seminar organized by Social Finance on it is from a series of seminars on employment and skill training. My name is Mare Roldi. I am the director of the Government Outcomes Lab at the University of Oxford, and I will be chairing the session today. The session is focused on the lesson from the use of outcome-based approaches to tackle employment issues with a focus on low and middle income countries. And today we have uh, a series of distinguished guests. We have uh, three speakers. We have uh, Abba Torasha from the British Asian Trust. We have uh, uh, Maria Laura Pinelli, also known as Malala, if we may. Uh, from Africa's Partners in um, South uh, America. She is working in Argentina and uh, Peter Nicolas from uh, Social Finance, who has um, worked, has a long career in the, at the World Bank, uh, de delivering a project that had an impact and in particular with result by based finance and now director at Social Finance UK. Um, the session today will run with a 40 minutes discussion. I will uh, have, uh, I will let the uh, speaker introduce themselves and I will ask some probing questions, but then we want to give about 20 minutes time for questions from the audience. The way you can ask a question, given that it will be um, in a, a number of you, uh, is through the Q&A function that you will see at the bottom of the screen. If you press a Q&A, you will be uh, able to post your question. Please do post questions as they come to mind, and uh, we will come to those and we will group them at the end of our, our initial conversation. Um, I just want to let everybody know that the, question, the session will be recorded and will be made available as soon as uh, soon after we finish on uh, a Utah uh, YouTube channel and you will receive information on how to access it. Um, so with no further ado, I would like to just frame briefly um, our session today. As I said, is uh, the first of a series of um, uh, webinars on employment. We are at the beginning of what is predicted to be a significant employment crisis in the coming years. The International Labour Organization predicts that, says that we already lost about 10% of the working hours globally, worldwide, and in low and middle income countries, this uh, drop in employment is even more significant where the informal sector is uh, more prevalent. We have estimate, recent estimate from the OECD with employment in India and also in Palestine uh, that are up of 25%. So this is a significant challenge uh, that we are confronted with. And today we are looking at uh, lessons that we can learn from the use of outcome-based approaches. And the key question that I will probe our speakers uh, with today is why looking at outcome-based approaches? Why now? We are living through a significant pandemic. Is this the right time, if ever? Uh, but just to whet our appetite, um, we have prepared um, a short poll for our audience to see where you stand at, uh, on with this issue. And uh, I wonder if uh, we can put up the poll. There is a simple question, which is, uh, what do you think is the primary value of using outcome-based approaches in supporting skilling and employment? And we have a number of suggested answers. Can you take a couple of minutes to try to, uh, to give your opinion on this poll? Ah, here it is.
think, eh? I think we can... Uh, I'll give 10 seconds to close the poll. Oh, it's closed, fantastic. Uh, can we see the results? Just to have a sense of where our audience is at on this question before uh, we have a discussion. So, okay. The majority of you thinks that is about strengthening this connection between the public spending and outcomes. So this is probably about, do we know what we are paying for? Uh, can we be clear about that? And uh, having these adaptive service delivery, so being able post-COVID recovery to deal with uncertainties. Significant number also on incentivizing partnerships. Okay, um, we'll come back to this uh, poll at the end of our conversation to see if uh, any of you have uh, changed uh, your mind. I can see in the others we had uh, the legal framework to do so is one of the reasons why we, want, we, we might want to use uh, um, outcome-based approaches in employment now. So I will uh, ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce uh, himself or herself by not telling us our, their bi biography. Can you just spend uh, two words on what is the particular expertise you are bringing to the table today? So what is your expertise in using outcome-based approaches in employment? And then spend a few uh, words on uh, what is, in your opinion, the highlight of why outcome-based approaches are well suited or not uh, to employment um, at this particular point in time and skilling. Can I start with uh, Richard, perhaps, who brings uh, experience from the World Bank as well as the social finance? Can you say something about what you bring to the table and why you think it might be a helpful approach? Sure, yeah. And I think, I mean, my background, as you mentioned earlier, was previously with the World Bank, including working on training and employment programs. and now working on the Palestine so-called Finance for Jobs project, uh, which focuses on paying for sustained employment outcomes rather than paying for input. And I think that in reference to the two items on the poll that got 50% or less, of the, less than 50% of the vote, uh, I, I think it's worth focusing on what we've seen in the West Bank in terms of both incentivizing partnerships between employers and service providers. We've seen that paying for sustained employment directly incentivizes employers and training providers to get together to make sure that the training really does produce uh, sustained jobs and doesn't just allow trainees to pass exams. Uh, and the other one is uh, on the increasing relevance of interventions to employers and employment markets. We've seen two things uh, there. One is that these partnerships obviously do make the training more relevant to employers, but also because we bid out uh, the contracts to achieve those outcomes, we got what economies, economists call a reveal preference. So we saw that uh, compared to the surveys we've done on what people said they would be willing to uh, pay for, when you actually ask them to put their money where their mouth is, uh, you got quite different results. So we ended up training for quite different jobs and quite different training from what the uh, survey suggested we would. Thank you, Peter. Um, Manala, can I come to you? What is the experience you bring to the table? And uh, why do you think this might be a helpful approach? Was that to Maria or to me, Mara? We couldn't hear to you. Maria. Thank you. I was going to ask the same. So what's the experience I bring to the table in relation to outcome funds? It's how to launch and then implement and achieve results where using an outcome funds, um, an outcome payment model in a, an extremely volatile context. Volatile because of the macroeconomic situation and also volatile now in the face of COVID and employment in the face of COVID and the effects of the pandemic in, in uh, low middle income countries. Uh, in terms of uh, the use of, of outcome payments for uh, 
the issue of employment, of course, solving employability or employment in an extremely volatile contract context, we're seeing that it's a tool that uh, presents uh, great advantages over other existing service uh, or, or FIFA service programs that the government or private service providers were implementing in the country, in Argentina. So we think that the flexibility and adaptability of outcome payment in a, in a context, context such as the one we're seeing in Argentina in the face of youth employment, it's a, it's a very useful tool. And we're learning um, a lot of, of, um, of, of uh, yeah, of, of, uh, we're gaining a lot of experience that we can apply not only now, but in future programs at governmental and private level. Can you comment on some of the lessons that you're learning? Absolutely. We're seeing that um, the flexibility uh, to adapt and, uh, and, and focus that adaptability in order to achieve the KPIs that we had originally set off to achieve, achieve is one of the greatest features that outcome payment contracts bring to the table. Um, the fact that the um, because you're, we're all together working towards achieving these results, um, the different service providers have to be agile and on their toes to, to pivot and to uh, adapt in the face of first a macroeconomic scenario that was very adverse and now in the face of, of the uh, well, an extra large quarantine that, that we have in the country uh, has allowed us to learn what works and what doesn't in a much more dynamic way that we would see in other pay for pay for service um, contracts that the government was implementing in the same context. We're also seeing a greater adaptability in terms of the outcome payer, which is the government, which in a traditional scenario will not be keen to adapt contracts. Uh, we're seeing that um, because they see the results that outcome payment contract in Argentina is, is bringing to the table, they're willing to modify bits of the contract uh, in order to adapt, um, uh, well, in order to adapt the, the, the results that we need to achieve in order to gain to gain the expected KPIs and results that we had set off to achieve. So we're seeing flexibility from all sides, which means that we can, um, we can confidently say that it's it's a tool that we can use in extremely volatile contexts in order to achieve what we set off to achieve at the beginning. Thank you. Abba, how about your experience? Hi, uh, good afternoon from London to colleagues who've joined from India, as well as I think there's, there's colleagues from South America and all over the world. So I'm grateful to be on this panel and, and both thank you to Mara and Luis for having me. The experience I bring is dual. Currently, we are uh, we we launched uh, with UBS Optimus Foundation, the Michael Susan Dell Foundation, a large education impact bond a few years ago, and we are implementing and delivering it in India. And we bring experience from that. And we're also designing in the last few months and fundraising for an for an employment impact bond in India. Um, and that brings COVID right to the forefront of our thinking and discussions. Uh, and I can bring some flavor of design and fundraising during the times of COVID to take, um, to take crisis into design as again, start with where we are on the other piece where we actually have to think about crisis having designed for good times. Um, so a real juxtaposition of, of two, two places which I'm able to bring to the table. And Mara, you said, uh, why, why outcomes-based contracts? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's where we always start, why outcomes-based contracts and is it the right tool to use? And in this case, the why for us is dual. Um, when the conversation started with our partners on this, we were looking at systemic challenges in India on moving to an outcomes framework, which was focusing on placement and retention within employment. When COVID hit, uh, those sorts of issues, while important, also, and you added import, a bunch of other things became important, the training centers couldn't be run, we couldn't carry on business as usual. And the real curiosity from all the partners who started coming together was, can this be a tool for adaptive learning and changing what has always been a problem in the sector and actually maybe even leapfrogging some of those challenges. Simple things like saying, do digital models work as well? Uh, do distance models work as well? Can employers play roles in apprentice-based delivery, which they never played before? So we have to do it very much like the way we're doing this seminar on Zoom in a way we never did before. So part of what we're doing and, and really having fun in design is thinking about what leapfrogging looks like and how we can actually bring that into design and consider what the future of work alongside what a good outcomes-based contract should look like in this program. So that, that's, that's too big for me. Thank you. Can I 
um, come back to Maria Laura. You, Abba, you are commenting on uh, uh, the importance of having this adaptability, and also Maria Laura, you mentioned the importance of uh, at the time of uh, of big changes. Um, the uncertainty that we are living through right now are unprecedented. And uh, th this contract seems to be designed to be, with, to be adaptable and respond to uncertainty. Based on the experience you had with the contracts you work on in uh, South America, did they respond well? In what way and why to the uncertainty of the pandemic crisis? Nobody could predict it. Yeah. So I think this is the greatest test. Yes. Yeah, nobody could predict the pandemic. And when we did all the risk analysis for the for the SIB in, in the city of Buenos Aires uh, in 2017, we predicted many things. We never predicted a pandemic. We predicted economic downturn. We predicted change of government. All of those happened, but we did not predict the extent to which this was going to be pushed off limits by a, a very long quarantine. Argentina has been in quarantine since the 15th of March, and they're only now beginning to release in phases, and they're likely to go back to square one. So this has had a tremendous negative effect on a country that already had uh, around 50% inflation and high unemployment rates, two years uh, and counting on recession. So the pandemic comes on top of all that. Um, why is this tool better than others, in, in my opinion? It's, it's because um, mainly be between the, the contracts that we have between the private parties, so between the service providers and the investors and the intermediaries, so the performance manager, we're able to pivot so rapidly in order to uh, achieve the, the KPIs and the results that we are we're seeking to achieve, which allow us now to have a 32% success rate, uh, even though all of all of the macroeconomic scenario, even though the, 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 the quarantine and the pandemic situation. Um, it has also allowed us to, because we have the numbers to prove it, by proving but proving what we're asking for with concrete data and with concrete success rates, it has enabled us to have a different kind of conversation with the outcome payer. When the outcome payer is only the government, and it's, this is the only case in Latin America where you have a SIB where the sole outcome payer is the government, um, it can become a very unbalanced conversation because contractually, when, you, when you're contracted by the government, even in an outcome payment scenario, um, the government has a, a lot more leverage and power over how to implement that contract. Um, so the only way around it, and what I see it's different from other government contracts that we've been involved with, is that we are able to produce fact after fact after fact and result after result to show the government that by fine tuning uh, certain bits and pieces of how we're achieving those outcomes, we're, we're going to be able to adapt in the face of much adversity. So. In my opinion, uh, where I see the greatest adaptability is in, in, in the service providers themselves and how they were able to pivot very rapidly and, for example, move all the uh, capacity building uh, portion of the of the contract to virtual in, in literally no time. In literally one month, they were all providing this service on a virtual basis on how they were able to pivot to go seek for the participants for the SIP when you, you cannot uh, physically um, uh, uh, like gather them to, 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 to bring them into the program um, and how the investors have also adapted in the face of, um, of, of, of what's going on with the economy and what uh, the service providers need in order to fulfill their duties. Uh, so I see the greatest flexibility and innovation coming from investors and service providers. The government, which is the outcome payer, moves a lot slower, but by us providing very detailed data on, on the outcomes that we're achieving, we're beginning to engage with the government in a very different kind of conversation in a much more constructive conversation that we would see in other uh, government contracts. Was there any challenge? Like I assume collecting data is much more difficult. Yes. <laughs> isn't it better if I'm a provider, like I'd rather have a, a grant, like give me a big check, thank you very much, and uh, just trust me. Um, yes, there are challenges, but not necessarily at service provider level. One of the 
um, most unique things that we have seen in terms of service providers is that one year on since we started implementing uh, the way they share data and the way they share learnings, which was one of the requests that we had for them, but it was not written in stone. Um, the, the fact that they're sharing best practice, what works, what doesn't, has allowed them to innovate in a much more rapid manner than they would have had if they had uh, remain in their silo with their contract with the government or a private uh, investor or donor. The fact that these are the uh, at least four, uh, three of the four uh, service providers that are partaking in the in the SIP are some of the largest foundations and organizations that work on youth employability and on employment in general. So it's like you're having Pepsi and Coke sharing best practice and sharing learnings, which has allowed them to fast track how they do things and uh, innovate, for example, in how do they reach out to the most vulnerable populations to bring them into a program. So yes, it, it, it has been challenging, but more with the outcome fair than between the private uh, service providers and the investors. With the government, as I, as I said before, the issue was that they're very used to when they, when they hire, when they contract, they're very used to their ways. They're very, they're, moving forward there's no flexibility in 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 contracts with the government uh, it doesn't matter if it's an outcome payment or if it's a service a fee for service contract uh, this is what has been the most challenging like trying to get the government on board and understanding that the beauty of the tool it's actually its flexibility and then if you keep the contract in a straight jacket uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to pivot and achieve results so the most challenging bit has not been gathering the data has not been uh, pivoting the service that we're providing to achieve results it has actually been moving the government to think differently uh, and that that has been the most challenging bit but we have we're beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel in in that sense uh, thank you maria laura Peter, can I come back to you? And uh, does this resonate with the experience in, on the West Bank? You focus in particular on the relationship between the provider and the, the employer. Um, how did they respond to this flexibility? Was it used? What were the enabler? What were the impediments? Yeah, I think, I mean, our experience in the West Bank is very similar to what Maria Lara is, is talking about. Uh, so because there was close communication and shared objectives between employers and training providers. They were able to move much more quickly and much more readily to virtual training uh, and to other workarounds uh, around COVID, which I think would have taken much longer if you'd had a traditional input-based systems where the, train, the training providers would have been mandated to do A, B, and C, and you know, B and C couldn't be done uh, virtually, and, and then it would require all sorts of contract uh, renegotiations. But with a simple focus on, on employment outcomes, it was much easier to both incentivize, but also to facilitate that sort of move to, to work around, including, as I say, virtual training. Can you comment on what uh, had to change? Because uh, you are suggesting that the type of employment has changed to respond to the needs of the market. But in terms of building the relationship, I think in a contract, you have to specify some terms and condition. And then there is this massive change in the situation and uh, you need to go back to the drawing board to an extent. Uh, what stayed the same and what has changed? So what was the flexibility that you used in terms of the contract? The outcomes have changed, the uh, targets, the payment level, the timelines? I mean, I think all, all four of those have changed uh, because you're, you're moving from a model where you're paying for training. So you're paying for people passing exams, uh, being successfully skilled, uh, on a criteria that might have been set sometime before and might well not match what employers even wanted at that time, but certainly not what they want with, say, COVID or increased unemployment or a more difficult market. Uh, so I think what you're seeing see that has changed is that you're focusing much more on what makes sense in the market today 
rather than what might have made sense in the market when the program was designed. Uh, and that means that you're training for the skills that are needed now rather than for the skills that were needed before. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's also had a more subtle effect, which is that people are thinking much more carefully about even in advance about whether their training is useful. Under the input-based model, where people would be paid for training, they would say, oh yeah, this is great training. You know, we've had 70% success rate, although they can't provide evidence for that, but they will say, say claim a 70% employment rate for their training uh, and produce all sorts of uh, encouraging examples of how good their training is. But as I say, when you actually ask them, what would it cost to get this many jobs? And they actually have to face up to the fact that their training has to, has to allow people to enter sustained employment. Then suddenly, you know, their whole approach changed and, and some of them dropped, dropped out, some of them tripled their price. I mean, it, it was a, a, a quite different model. And new people came in in sectors that we hadn't uh, imagined. So I think that's been a, a very big, change in the way that, that every, everyone's behavior has, has panned out. Thank you, Peter. Abba, how about India? What is the employment situation there or how the crisis has impacted the situation? I'll talk about how the crisis has impacted the situation. I'll also talk about how crisis has impacted design, pulling mm -hmm. some threads through from what Malala and Peter have said as well. Um, and I'm going to use uh, six indicators of what are what's, what's happening with beneficiaries, what's happening with providers, what are investors telling us, where are outcome funders' heads right now, what does government want and what do employers want, all the key parties on the table, um, all interacting in different ways with each other. The situation is dire as everywhere, so that's nothing. I'm not telling a news story. It's like picking up the newspaper. Unemployment is rising 27% right now. Uh, communities are migrating back to villages. Uh, Women are disproportionately disadvantaged by, you know, both the mental health issues, you know, domestic violence. So uh, you couldn't find a bigger disaster to actually think about in terms of where the beneficiaries are. Uh, what does that mean, however, when you want to think about what employment skills you want to give them, especially if they aren't in urban-based centers and the training centers aren't two minutes away from them? And that's one thing we have to think about. Do we have to take training to them or does training have to, do they have to come to training? Um, starting, and I'm starting there with beneficiaries. Moving on to providers. Providers have had a sort of classic approach where attribution of training and linking it to whether a person stays in a job is hard anyway. And to think about it in a COVID situation where other reasons could determine why you don't stay in a job or get into a job makes it even more complicated for them to price and determine attribution. Really a deep area of our thinking is around how do we link training attribution to impact within this period? And perhaps during the lifetime of the bond, because it's a four-year period, you might have a COVID year where it's slightly different in, in sort of perspective. Third on investors, uh, impact investors continue to be buoyant and wanting to make this investment to, 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 make, to stimulate the market and to change it. However, they bring a dose of real, realism now that I haven't seen before. So while they remain very, very optimistic, they're also much more realistic than I'd like them to be and not as pushy on outcomes. And perhaps that's a really interesting conversation. They see where their sector is and therefore the, the, the considerations for them are much deeper in terms of cost of capital and how it ties up into a transaction. Then let's talk about outcome funders. Outcome funders as always want to reach the last mile. Let's talk about, they want to make sure gender is not let out, left out. They want to make sure that actually informal sectors are catered to in this, in this transaction. Then, with that comes this whole issue of how do you measure that because informal sector measurement of employment outcomes is slightly more complicated and expensive. And how do you keep costs down while you want to reach the last mile? Again, very interesting insight there and I, I can add depth if people want. And finally, what is government thinking? Government wants to do this fast and they want to do it yesterday. They've got migrants unemployed sitting in the last mile in India. They don't want to be um, waiting to the last for a four year contract to be set up. They want it to happen day before yesterday. So real sense of urgency from government. And that brings me to where we are with the transaction. Speed in a way I've never seen before in terms of being able to pull things together and people wanting to work together in ways I've never seen people wanting to contribute, put data on the table and said, let's, let's get it happening. Because by talking about it endlessly, we aren't going to solve the problem that we had. Um, so those are my perspectives from India, both in terms of design as well as where the employment 
sector is and how we're sort of trying to meet those needs of various stakeholders around the table. I'll, I'll take you up on this uh, aspect of speed, yeah. because um, if you read the literature on outcome-based contracts, they say, oh, it takes forever to set one up. <laughs> so I want to challenge you and the other speakers. Isn't that a constraint? So maybe because we are living through an emergency, we should go to something that we know how to do and to do quickly and to do uh, well. And outcome-based contract is something for a time outside the crisis when we have the time to plan and we have a period of growth. So speak. Let me, let, me, let me use an analogy here, Mara. You have two pots of money. There's a time when you have lots of money and there's a time you don't have a lot of money. Right now, we don't have a lot of money. Incomes are, income is down for the sector. Income is down uh, overall for, for governments. Governments uh, have been borrowing like never before. When income is down, you want to use a contract which allows you to save money as well as get what you want. You want to have your cake and eat it too. So if you are asking me why now, I think that is one of the top reasons because you really won't create impact with the minimal budgets that you're working with. Or it may not be as, you know, it, it's not as black and white a context, but broadly all funders are making those decisions. How do we allocate our dollars spent to get better outcomes? And does that dollar spent enable us to do better things right now as we are considering lower budgets, whether it's a CSR fund, funder or a government funder or anybody else? We have that conversation almost every day with people. So I think that's why speed and that's how they're considering that as part of their offering to the funding that they're giving out in the market. Thank you. Uh, I'll come back in a second because uh, maybe it's the right tool, but on average it takes uh, several months to set up. Can we speed it up? Maria Laura, what is your experience? You think uh, you can do it quick? Um, I think and uh, seconding what what Ava has just said, at, at the moment, at this particular moment, uh, cash strapped governments will speed up many processes. That is what actually makes the creation of the first, second, third round of an outcome payment contract uh, so long. It's it's all the negotiation and buying at higher and at different levels, at high level and lower levels, uh, to make it work. So especially if you're using a, 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 a sort of a governmental outcome payer. Uh, because the situation is dire and because they're cash strapped, uh, you're, what we're seeing now is that you're, you have a, a lot more openness to be talking at, at minister level to get outcome payment moving because they see this as a solution to the problem that they currently don't have a budget to look into issues such as employment, such as education, dropouts, etc. cetera. Uh, but they, they will regain that budget in maybe one, two years time. Mm -hmm. So they see this as part of the solution, hence they're likely to move faster. Um, you cannot just uh, do an outcome contract like this. Um, if you're starting from scratch, if you've never done it in that country, or if, or if it's a topic that you, that you don't have enough evidence uh, to use as proxy for, even if it hasn't been developed in that particular country. But with the specific issue of employability and employment, this is one of the most uh, selected issues to, to work on with through outcome payment. So we have by now enough information and enough proxies. And, and in that sense, the, the government outcome lab have, has been great uh, to, to gather all this information through which you can really speed up the process. And uh, the same way that um, the scientists are iterating and, and test trying and error, trying and error to, to try and get a vaccine to COVID, we should be doing the same with outcome contracts. And it is something that we're discussing very seriously with the government in Argentina and with other governments in South America, such as Uruguay and, and others in, in the Southern Cone. Because in a way, it's a perfect storm, it's a perfect opportunity to move faster, to try and to, and to find solutions that otherwise it would have taken us months and months uh, to develop. Um, one last thing I'm going to say is that by going faster, it doesn't mean that we need to dilute uh, one of the fortes of the of, of the tool, which is uh, you really need to calibrate those uh, outcomes right in order for it to work. Uh, so you cannot just copy paste from some other country and, and go out and do an outcome payment. But what I'm saying is that there is enough information right now to calibrate those results well, to know what works and roughly what doesn't um, and, and just go forward. Um, in order to do that, you need the lawyers on your side. You need very clever lawyers that are able to think outside the box that will give the contractual terms enough flexibility so that when you are doing a little bit of trial and error as you're moving, this can be done. 
if we're straight jacketed into a contract that you cannot move, it's going to be very difficult to perfect the outcomes uh, and, and, the, and the results that you're uh, paying for uh, as you move along. But definitely it's something we can do faster, cheaper, and we should try it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, from the audience, we are starting to get some questions and I encourage the audience to keep posting questions. I'm coming to you in a second. Peter, what is your uh, take? in terms of uh, we are talking, uh, Abba was talking about uh, speed and one of the criticisms of those contracts is that agreeing the outcomes, measuring it, validating it takes a lot of time and but we need to set up something quickly and uh, the situation is changing very quickly. How do you, why is it still a good idea or when could it be a good idea and when is a bad idea? I mean, I think it, the, the a couple of points. I mean, it can take at least for the, the first time you do it longer to set up an outcomes based contract, uh, although they're likely to be more effective. But once you set one up, uh, we've seen that extending it is very easy if you want to do that or adapting it is very easy if you want to do that. But also that once it's set up, then things become quicker and more flexible than they do in traditional projects. Uh, so there's there's a loss at the beginning of the process. Uh, but once it's established, then you get significant gains in both time and effectiveness. And certainly, I think there's a danger in rushing into a situation uh, on an input based input basis, just assuming that you know what employment needs there are and what skills training needs there are. And you may just be wasting money uh, that could have been used with a bit more of a delay to to produce jobs that are actually sustained and i mean just one point is, is that on the west bank project we put a significant emphasis on sustained jobs so that means jobs that go past the point under palestinian law at which a person becomes difficult to, to to fire so the employers have a real commitment when they decide to keep that person on and when the payment is is triggered whereas in a lot of other training programs, there may be ways in which you can game the system, get somebody into an apprenticeship for a few months, and then they're let go, and therefore you meet your, your uh, metrics. Uh, whereas with sustained employment, the, the employer really has to show that that really has to reveal that that person is, is, is valuable to them, because they're putting a lot of money into, into paying them for an indefinite period. So take, I suggest we open up to the audience as questions are coming, as certain come in. Um, I'll take them in order. And uh, if raise your hand if you want to take it or I'll, I'll give it to any of the panelists. So I have a question from Fernando who is asking, how do you establish what are the objectives of an outcome-based model? And I assume for object, yeah, Peter? I mean, I think normally you would initially work with a government uh, and discover what their employment goals are, but also to work with the private sector to see what their employment needs are. Uh, and then on that basis, you establish what your goals are, whether it's simply sustained employment or whether it's a focus on disadvantaged youth or on women. Uh, I mean, in the West Bank, we have a, a, a incentive uh, to have women enroll in the program. Uh, the focus there is on youth. Uh, uh, and those were uh, emphases that emerged from talking to government and uh, from talking to civil society and, and employers. Mara, I might, uh, I, might, I might try and be a little bit controversial and beg to differ if I may. I think uh, that uh, that might be something I might do on a grant program as well. I think uh, what I might might suggest to Peter is that on on an, on an outcomes based contract, I would ask my uh, you know my commissioner or my outcome pay of government or otherwise as to what are those stubborn challenges that are unmet by grant and regular mm. usual input based mechanisms. And for example, if they're seeing sustained bad outcomes for gender targets or sustained bad outcomes for employer. Uh, employers keeping people in employment and the quality of training not working for that employers, then I would say right here, let's let's use this as a tool for that problem. So my approach to this tends to, or our approach as an organization is about what is a stubborn challenge that is unmet by a grant and how does one then solve a problem? So if the current problem is that, uh, that TVET center providers give training in India, 
uh, and you want to change the paradigm to have a very different kind of training, which can't be measured through a regular contract, what can we do with an outcomes contract that can be helpful to move the sector along? So Peter, uh, over to you, but that, that's sort of a two, two bits from our end. No, no, actually, I, I agree with that. <laughs> Arman, can I keep you on the line? Because uh, a question was addressed to you by um, Swarup, Swarup. Um, about, uh, especially for the case of India, where the job market is struggling, and uh, why working a job is the outcome. Yeah, I, I answered Swarup because I knew he'd pick me up on it. Hi, Swarup. Uh, absolutely, we aren't, uh, we aren't, uh, we aren't, we aren't rigid on uh, just wage employment. Uh, all partners are telling us to keep entrepreneurship in the mix because the indicators will need to be different. So you might have to say they're starting small to medium businesses. What's the sustainability of that business as against the wage or how long people stay in employment? Uh, and we will have to make sure there's a basket of, uh, of, of products within that, within the bond. But yes, I stand corrected on that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Alva. Cheers. Thank you. Um, I have a, we have a question uh, from Patricia, who uh, maybe picks up a little bit what Maria Laura was saying about the structure of the contracts and there are street jackets. So how do you structure these contracts? And in particular, uh, how do you uh, protect the employees during a crisis? So you don't achieve the outcome. What happens to people? So you don't pay, fine, but what's happening to people who don't get an, a, a, a job or opportunity to self-employ? So it depends on how you structure the outcome. I mean, when I was talking about contracts, uh, I was talking about the contracts that sustain the outcome payment model. So the contracts between the outcome payer and the uh, investors and the service providers. In terms of uh, the Argentina said the way we structured the outcomes means that in order for the result to be valid, that individual, that, uh, that young individual needs to be hired formally, and that's very clearly defined by law. Uh, and in order for the, uh, the, the second outcome to be valid, which is that they need to sustain the, the job for four months, uh, that's also uh, very clearly established in the contractual terms and in the indicators that we're using to validate. What happens to the individual uh, in a situation like the one we're now when they if they lose their job and, and we are seeing a lot of that we're seeing a lot a, a massive shift towards uh, or not a massive but a, a very big shift towards informality and we're seeing also a shift to more more um, more, more unstable job formats and, and temporary job formats and that has to do with uh, some regulation that the government has imposed for, for employers in the country. So what we are doing with that or what service providers better said are doing with, with that is the, the, the fact that the particular individual has not achieved an outcome for the SIB doesn't mean that we, we drop it and, and look for another one that can achieve the outcome. Uh, service providers continue working with this individual and actually within the contract between the investors and the service providers, um, the, the, the service provision needs to go on and the, and the mentoring needs to go on six months after they finish the capacity building. And this is to ensure that whether they get into employment right after the capacity building bit or whether they get into employment in the few months after that, um, the, the mentoring and the accompaniment doesn't stop. There's, there's not a hard stop. And what we have done now to adapt that bit is that we've extended that to 12 months and that 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 um, 12 months of, of uh, mm -hmm. like going with the individual so as to not to drop it cold in the face of, of, of what's going on with the pandemic. Um, it's also accepted by the outcome payer as a valid result. So on a on a human level we, we don't drop them <laughs> on a contractual level it's all pre-established in the outcomes on how they're paid and validated thank you i'm uh, i'm gonna um group two I, I want to give you two questions and uh, one question is from robert who says uh, at the at the moment during the crisis we are using uh, blog runs so that we providers we know, the way we are responding to the COVID crisis, so we can move quickly. And uh, that seems sensible. So maybe in terms of uh, responding to a crisis, we should use these uh, grants with known providers and uh, um, outcome-based contracts maybe might be helpful later on rather than in the crisis. Do you agree? This is one of the questions. 
And then I want to uh, link together two separate questions that are about uh, scalability. And uh, two of uh, our uh, attendees, Paolo and an anonymous attendee, mentioned that it might be easy to create an employment contract for six, 12 months on with five, 10,000 uh, participants, but can, it, can you do it at scale? And the related question from Paolo is, uh, where you don't have enough resources and we're going through a recession, setting up this uh, structure costs a lot of time and resources. So if you don't have the scale to justify these costs, what can you recommend? What is the next best? So the first one, can I give it to you, Peter? Responding to an emergency is uh, an outcome-based contract fit for purpose, isn't doing like a quick runs with people we can trust and know. I mean, I think it depends on the, the circumstances. I think, yes, a, a, a grant is the best way if you're confident that you know what's needed and you know that the service providers will be properly incentivized by the grant uh, to perform well. But if those conditions aren't met, then it may not be the most, most efficient uh, method. Can I give you a quick follow-up one in terms of uh, if I need to do some emergency training, should I set up an outcome-based contract? We know how not, to do it. Not if you want to do emergency training, unless, as I mentioned earlier, you already have an outcome-based contract mm -hmm. and you can issue an RFP with you know 10 days deadline uh, to get the, the best result out of, out of whatever need you're trying to to fill and, and maybe just while while my mic's open, the on the on the scaling question, uh, I think that again because you're using uh, or at least you can use RFP scaling actually isn't isn't that hard. Uh, and in terms of cost, I think it's important to remember that hopefully the outcomes approach will produce significantly better effectiveness. Uh, so you may get more cost, but you should get we hope you will get uh, even more, a uh, multiple uh, of an increase in, in effectiveness in terms of uh, people going into, into permanent jobs. Thank you. A quick comment from Ava and Maria Laura on scale. Scale, uh, you can't do without it in our country. Uh, we are a billion of us all around the globe. So uh, we, we, uh, are, we are, in definition, we're, uh, we talk scale. Um, so I'll answer that in two ways. To us, cost efficiency sit in the middle of scale. You don't have endless money right now to, um, to validate costs on high end and then say, how do you bring costs down over a period of time? So really one of our main, main design principles is how do you do it in a cost efficient way that makes sense to government and is sustainable and market will buy into it um, in future. So uh, while we may not be doing for a million as, as the chat question has suggested, we're definitely thinking between 40 to 50,000 beneficiaries at a minimum within the fund that we are designing. And in there, uh, one of the interesting things with the skilling sector in India is uh, the number of people who are mobilized to the number of people who are actually placed in jobs, there's almost a 50% drop um, in, in that. You know, and I, I don't know if that's the case for everywhere else, but that's the numbers I'm looking at. So you mobilize a larger number of people than you actually uh, get into an outcome of, an, of staying in a job. And one of the interesting conversations we are having is how do we change those, that attrition rate within the model to have better efficiency and what are the drivers and what are the nudge effects that are needed on that? Is it better mobilization? Is it better, uh, is it better understanding of what the employer needs? And therefore, overall, the attrition rate drops and therefore there's more efficiency at scale in a way we've not seen before. So uh, it's a fascinating area of work. And hopefully within a few months, we can also give you some of those insights of where we are taking the market. Maria Laura, you have a word on scale. Uh, yeah, uh, scalability, uh, I think that's uh, the second key word to any outcome payment because the first one is so expensive to build or the first couple of ones. And that's a lesson we learned in Latin America as a whole. We see that the programs that were born um, with, with, and, and within their framework, uh, they had scalability built in, like the Colombia example or the Chile example are a lot more successful because you, you gain economy of scale. Um, in the case of Argentina, we're, we're now working on scaling the program and on, as, as Peter was mentioning, um, expanding the program because the issue is still very valid and because there's, a, there's even greater need. Um, 
scalability is, is key also to get uh, more conclusive results on whether the tool works or not as compared to other ways of or, or more traditional ways of contracting both for a government or for traditional philanthropists um, so so yes and as Abba was saying we also see that uh, attrition rates um, in order to get like 32 percent of your base into employment you need to have almost double the amount of individuals that you had originally anticipated going through the funnel in order to get to the results. So um, it needs to be born scalable or it needs to be born already big so that you can you can cater for, for the need, but also that you can generate these economies of scale. Thank you, Maria Laura. I have, have a couple of questions from uh, Stephen. And then another a couple of detailed questions from Fernando. And Stephen is interested in uh, what do you train for and who should do the training and uh, how you can use an outcome uh, contract. I assume, uh, Stephen, you mean an outcome contract um, to promote character strength, soft skill training. You know, when you define an outcome, often the outcome is a particular uh, employment position, but there are these other skills that uh, create good quality jobs. So do you measure them? Can you put those in the contract? And then does any of you have any experience on what is the role of universities in uh, supporting the creation of uh, good job opportunities? Like when universities are great employers themselves and they have a, fun a fundamental role in uh, equipping students in the skill they have to find and maintain a good job. So how can base contract for these like character strength, soft skill I can, training? I can pick up soft skills. Um, and I would say on soft skills, Mara uh, and Steven, there, there isn't a provider in India who is good, who doesn't do soft skill training. And it's and for me, it's an input. Uh, and it's an input that increases attribution of the employment training that goes beyond, let's say, training you to be a good sanitation worker whether your attitude is right and whether you stay in the job goes way beyond whether you're going to actually know how to clean something well or to take someone's temperature well. And the best providers that we see in the market, really exciting, innovative partners are doing soft skills over and above everything else. And actually there's a partner we're assessing right now that does only do soft skills. And their theory of change is actually if you give people, you know, the skills that are transferable, it doesn't matter what the job, they will stay in employment. Um, so within our model, our aspiration is to train uh, is while we're considering training and employment, we really put soft skills up there because we find all providers tell us that is why people stay in jobs. Uh, at least that's the experience and learning we have at this point in time. Uh, and I'm sure Maria will have more. From also, sorry, just, just to add one quick thing on that. The, the, I think having a focus on sustained employment means that there's an incentive for skills training providers to keep focusing on soft skills during the initial apprenticeship stage. And particularly you get uh, you know, feedback loops from the employers who will complain that the first trainees they got didn't have these and these soft skills. And so the providers are incentivized to A, correct that, but also B, uh, with their new trainees to, to bake that in from the beginning of the, of the training. And in, in what in the case of, of the SIP that we're implementing, what we're seeing is that not only that it's embedded in, in the service provision that we require from, from the providers, um, and it's part, it's a key part, or a key component of the capacity building, but it's also the most valued uh, piece of the whole um, experience of the whole program by beneficiaries themselves. Last year in December, we did a series of focus groups and an evaluation uh, talking directly with the beneficiaries from, from the program. And this, this was the single thing that every single individual that we spoke to, and we spoke to many of them, um, sig signal us this is the most important thing that I got from the program. And, and, and adding on on that, um, in the face of the current situation, which is ex extremely hard to get a job in Argentina, it doesn't matter which, which section of the population you come from. Um, what, again, beneficiaries are valuing is that even if they don't manage to get into employment, they're, they're being able to transfer the soft skills into finding whatever they need to find in order to survive. And they, they're seeing this in a, on a positive light, moving into formal employment in the, in the near future. So soft skills is key. I think that um, without that, um, talking about employment makes no sense. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, there are more questions and uh, we'll reply to this question online in the interest of time. We promise everybody will finish at uh, like in the next three minutes. So can I bring the poll up again to uh, ask people again the same question we asked at the beginning. And in the meantime, I want to ask the panelists to collect your thoughts for a 30 seconds takeaway message that you want our audience to take away with them. 30 seconds. Okay, can we see the results? Can we close the panel and go back to our panelists? What are the results in our panel? Ah, so we are even more convinced that we need to strengthen the connection between the public spending and the outcomes and a growing interest in the need to incentivize partnership between employers and providers and increasing the relevance of the intervention to the employer. So there has been a shift in the, the conversation. So I think this is uh, great that uh, we learned something uh, that we didn't know at the beginning of this session. I will uh, go to each of the panelists in uh, turn, starting with like Abba, Maria, Maria Laura and uh, Peter to close. And uh, we will answer the unanswered question in the um, chat. If your question wasn't answered, please stay with us if you can. Abba, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, gosh, I, I didn't know you were going to go to me first, but I'll tell you what I think in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, think the, I think the opportunity to really to do something different and do it at scale is, is like never before. There is a problem you're facing. Communities are at, at risk. And if creative outcomes-based contracts can be part of the answer, let's think of it as part of the answer, not the answer. So no binary conversations about it being an answer to every problem, but definitely one part of the tools that you use to create and change a sector. And if it's seen like that by commissioners, I think you will use it in a, in a good way as against a tool to answer everything and then criticize for everything that it can't do. So perhaps approaching it as a tool as against as a silver bullet is my, is my 30 seconds. Thank you, Abba. Maria Laura, your takeaway message. The takeaway message is that it's um, it's a tool that can be used in in the in the middle of a crisis, and and, and Argentina is a living proof that it can. Uh, it's a tool that provides the flexibility, the, the resilience, and the opportunity to innovate at a at a scale and at a speed that you cannot see uh, with other tools. Because you, it's a tool that can be used to innovate, then you need to allow for some of the results that you expected not to be there. You, you, you need to allow for a little bit of experimentation. So if you're okay with that, then by all means go for it because it definitely works and it definitely provides results. Thank you, Maria Laura. Peter? I think actually that Abba and Maria Laura said everything I was gonna say, so I'll go with them. Fantastic. So. I indeed I want to thank the audience. We are one minute over time, so uh, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I learned certainly a lot. And uh, keep uh, tuned. I think uh, there will be future uh, seminars in this series, and uh, you will receive information in the email. Thank you so much, and uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you.